Today we're going to talk about something that is similar in, in some ways, and it's called cost of following Jesus. Because whether you recognize it or not, the first thing that we're going to talk about, and we're going to see in our Bible story today out of Luke chapter 14, is that the cost of following Jesus is expensive. That's point number one in your app if you want to write that down. The cost of following Jesus is expensive. And when it comes to our family, which Jesus is going to reference here in this Bible story, and when it comes to our treasured relationships, the Bible is going to teach us today that Jesus wants that parachute. Jesus wants to be first in your life. Jesus first, family second. That's what he's going to tell us here. And so look chapter 14. We're going to see here, first point is that the cost of following Jesus is expensive. So we're going to start reading at verse 25. Luke chapter 14, verse 25. Jesus is talking here, and this is what he tells us. A large crowd was following Jesus. He turned around and said to them, If you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. Your father and mother, your wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own wife. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. Skip down to verse 33. He says, so you cannot be my disciple without giving up everything you own. Brothers and sisters, one of the things that the Bible teaches us here in this simple story is that the cost of following Jesus is expensive. The price of following Jesus is high. Jesus says he wants to be first, family second. You know, when I was growing up as a child, we used to sing a song in church that I suspect many of you uh, have probably also sung a time or two. And before I tell you what the title is, let me give you the background behind the lyrics of, of this title. It involved, the story of the song uh, involves a man who lived in the region of Assam, India. 150 years ago, and some of you might know this, there was a spiritual revival that broke out in the United, in Wales, United Kingdom. And as a result of what they call the spiritual awakening, as a result of this, this revival, the, the Germans and, and the England, people from England, they, would, they sent a, a host of missionaries into India to share the good news of, of Jesus' love with the villagers, with the tribes people. Well, one of the first tribesmen in India who was led to Christ was a man by the name of Simon K. Merrick. Simon K. Merrick. And upon his conversion to Christianity, Simon began to share his faith with his fellow villagers, many of whom also gave their, their hearts to Jesus. And one would think that, you know, everybody would be happy about that. But in this case, the tribal chief was not. In fact, he was so upset by what was taking place in this, this, this conversion, if you will, of these villagers, of these local villagers, that he summoned everybody together. He called Simon Merrick forward, along with his wife and two children, and he told them that they either had to publicly renounce their faith in Jesus or face execution kind of reminds us of the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if you're familiar with that story in the book of Daniel in the Bible. Well, not only did Simon K. Merrick not denounce his faith in Jesus, but apparently in that very moment, moved by the Holy Spirit, he instantly came, composed this song that became famous, a song that goes like this. I have decided to follow Jesus. You know what? I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. 
no turning back. Then he wrote another verse. He says, though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back. You know that song? You sung that song? You know, what choice would you make if you were in Simon Merrick's sandals? Would you choose public execution for yourself, your wife, and your two children? Or would you choose Jesus? The cost of following Jesus is expensive. Now write this down. Ponder this. Point number two in your notes. Next thing that we're going to see here in this Bible story in verse 27 is that the cost of following Jesus demands a personal investment. The cost of following Jesus demands a personal investment. Let's skip to verse 27. Jesus says this next. He says, if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. If you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot become or be my disciple. Translation, the cost of following Jesus is personal. You know, the Bible writes, writer tells us in the book of Romans chapter 10 verse 9 that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, right? You know that verse? What's the Bible teach? Well, basically it teaches that I can't believe in God for you and you can't believe in God for me. I can't confess your sins before God, and you can't confess my sins before God. Rather, it's a personal choice. That's what Jesus and the Bible teaches here. The decision to follow Jesus is a personal one. You know, no matter how desperately I want you to find and follow Jesus, at the end of the day, it is a personal choice. And that's what Jesus is telling us here, that the cost of following Jesus is a personal one. And it requires a personal investment. You know, on Monday nights, uh, many of you men who are part of Palm Harvest, we have a Bible study. We, uh, we don't meet every week. We may maybe meet every couple weeks. We're going to be three weeks from now. We'll be meeting, I think, what's the, that's the day, Kurt, November the 13th or something like that. Uh, second week in November, we're going to start our new study. But one of the things that we do every, uh, in our studies, we, we look at the Bible and we try to, how are we going to apply it in our, in our life? And this last week, Kirk, uh, who led us, leads our study, led us to a book called Philemon. Uh, Philemon is a, it's a short book or a letter in, in the New Testament. It's only 25 verses long. And so if you've never read a book of the Bible, that's a good book to start with and say, well, yeah, I've read at least one book of the Bible, uh, the book of the letter of Philemon. And in this book of, of Philemon, Philemon, which we study together as men, it's written by the Apostle Paul, who was one of the early Christians, uh, early followers of Jesus. He was a missionary throughout really Europe and, and a, a church planter. And he's writing this letter to Philemon, who, uh, because of Paul's witness, became a Christian. Now, at the time when we read this letter, we're told that Philemon is a slave owner. And so, apparently back in, even in Jesus' day, there were, there were, I don't know if they had plantations back then, but the gist is there were people who had slaves, and Philemon had a slave by the name of Onesimus who ran away. He was a kunta kente, right, of, of uh, roots. Is that what it's called, roots? Roots, roots right. And uh, so he, 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 Onesimus flees uh, his slavery captivity. Somehow he lands in proximity with the Apostle Paul who, who talks to him about Jesus. Onesimus becomes, he gets saved. Pretty amazing in 25 verses that this, this, all, this story is there. But he becomes saved. And part of his decision now is as a new Christian is should I go back to my slave owner? 
Now that I've given my life to Jesus, I know that running away from Philemon, even though it was a bad situation in that day and age, slavery was apparently accepted. Now as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, do I go back? And possibly not only a life of slavery, but maybe worse, maybe I get my leg cut off or you know, I'm punished and, I, and I'm killed. And if you read this letter, Paul is writing to Philemon, a guy who he had once introduced to Jesus. Paul was sort of the, the spiritual mentor or the father of Philemon. And Paul writes this letter to Philemon saying, listen, Onesimus is coming back home. He's become a Christian. He's super helpful to me in my ministry right now. I really don't want him to leave, but he feels like, and I kind of agree with him, that maybe one of the decisions he needs to make now as a result of following Jesus is he needs to make this personal sacrifice, and he's coming home. And Paul writes this letter to say, Philemon, you owe me. And he says, I, I'm challenging you to forgive him and receive him not as a slave, but as a brother in the Lord of which Philemon now has to make a decision. Do I not only not punish this slave, but do I set this slave free? Because now, based upon what Paul's writing, his admonition to me is he's now a brother in the Lord. And possibly even maybe send him back to Paul to help Paul in his, his ministry. And with this, with this, this, this 25 verses in the book of Philemon illustrate for us is that the cost of following Jesus demands a personal investment. You know, friends, the gift of salvation is a free gift, right? The Bible teaches how Jesus paid the price for our forgiveness. That being said, the Bible teaches that being a follower of Jesus, and Jesus wants his followers to know here in Luke chapter 14, he wants you and me to know that with this freedom also comes responsibility. With freedom comes opportunity, and in many cases, sacrifice. You know, most winning teams, if you've ever been a part of one, they have high expectations for their coaches and their players, don't they? And Jesus is basically saying, if you're going to be a part of my team, my expectations are equally high. To be a part of my team is expensive. To be a part of my team is going to require some personal investment. I want the parachute. I want you to place me above priority above everybody else. Now, those of us who are followers of Jesus know that when we put God first in our life, everything else kind of falls into place, doesn't it? It's when we, when we put other things ahead of Jesus that that's when things get really messy and, and often carnage results. But Jesus said, the cost of following me demands a personal investment. So ponder this. For those of you who call yourself a Christian, are you fully invested or are you just playing around? You know, do you have a roll up your sleeves? How can I give of myself mentality? How can I serve you perspective? Or are you just riding along on the coattails of someone else's sacrifice? You know, as I was pondering this, and this is sort of off topic, and I'm going to spew a little bit. Remember a couple weeks ago how I said I'm going to start speaking out? Uh, get ready. Here we go. You know, I don't know about you, but... Um, it angers me when American students spew venom against the United States of America. You know, it, it, the very country that gives people their freedom in the first place to go to college and to live in a safe and secure neighborhood, it, it, I have zero tolerance for people who spew anti-American stuff, who protest. They're exercising their freedom, but they're speaking against the very country that gives them the freedom in the first place. And my perspective is, is that if you want to, you know, if you want to be pro Hezbollah and Islamic Jihad and Hamas, Hamas, then renounce your citizenship of the United States and go live in Lebanon or go live in Iran. Amen. Right. Just, I'm just being truthful here. You know, I've heard it said that, that 
the number of people killed in Israel from the terrorist attack on October 7th was about 1,400 plus, right? And you say, that's not that big of a number. It isn't until you put it in perspective of when you compare the, the citizenship of is Israel to the citizenship of the United States. And maybe you, some of you have heard this. If you compare 1,400 Israelites who were massacred in their home while they were sleeping on October 7th to the number of citizens in the United States, that would be equivalent to about 35,000 American citizens. Now think about this. 10 years ago on 9-11, there were like 2,987 people who lost their lives in the immediate attack when two, right, the, when the, uh, uh, Islamic terrorists hijacked airplanes and flew into the tw Twin Towers. So about, we'll just round it up. We'll just say 3,000 people were killed in that initial blast and how many thousands of people have lost their lives subsequently because of health and stuff. So 3,000 people into 35,000 people is, that's like 12 different Twin Tower events. So think about this. 10 years later, we are still remembering the sacrifice and that, that terrible event that happened on 9-11 in New York City. You tell me this, that the United States, how would the United States have responded military, militarily that if in addition to the two airplanes that crashed into the Twin Towers, that the Islamic terrorists had also crashed two airplanes into Disneyland, and into Dodger Stadium, and into San Francisco, and into Chicago, and into Boston, and into Nashville, and maybe into Mount Rushmore. That's seven, right? Maybe into Denver, maybe into Dallas, maybe into South Coast Plaza, 10 times 3,000, that's 30,000. You think the American people would be going, oh yeah, stop. No way. We wouldn't be calling for a ceasefire. Why? Because the carnage would be massive. You know, personally, I think the chances are strong that the United States is headed into another war. No bueno. World War III is coming, brothers and sisters. This, I, told, I shared this a couple weeks ago after this hit, that this is going to be a long war. I think it's going to be one or two years before this settles. And if you put it in our context, if we had 12 cities or 10 cities where 3,000 people were hit, you can understand that. And there's, there's a similarity here because Jesus is saying freedom is free, but freedom has a cost. On topic here, Jesus is saying, listen, if you want to be a follower of mine, Christianity has a cost. To be a Christian has a cost. You see, the cost of following Jesus is expensive. You know, the, the, these students, they didn't shed their blood on the battlefield to, to, to celebrate, you know, this freedom that they're experiencing. Brothers and sisters, do you, do you appreciate the sacrifice of those who have gone before us, who have served in the military to give us the freedom that we have? Do you have an appreciation for our forefathers? You know, one of the great things about our forefathers, if you know church history and many of you, or I mean, not church history, United States history, is they debated, but they did it civilly. You know, there's a place for, for disagreement. In fact, that's how the Constitution was written, in a way so that we could disagree with each other, but to do so with respect and dignity and honor. And Jesus is just saying here, recognize that, that to follow Jesus, to follow him, is, it's expensive and it demands a personal investment. You know, when I think about our church, and, and let's just put it in, in, in Palm Harvest context here, you know, it takes a team to have a healthy church. Would you agree with that? It takes a team to positively impact people's lives. You know, early in our service today, we had Joseph Gudino, age 14, playing the guitar, and Chance Moe, age 13, playing the keyboard. They didn't just come up here and just grab the instruments. Someone's been investing in them. And so I want to thank you as a church family for not only supporting this, these young men with your encouragement, which I know you'll do following our service today, but I also want to say thank you for you to those of you who have given your time and your money and your prayers and your resource to our church because it helps me as a pastor to be able to hire guys like David and, and Beto who can invest in, in these young men with their, their time and energy to help 
chance and, and Joseph developed this passion and, that they have for music to maybe use it in a way to, to glorify Jesus. Are you with me? It takes a team. It takes all of us. We're all part of this, this experience and impacting this next generation. And it just reinforces this truth that following Jesus demands and invites a personal investment. I hope you feel good about that. You know, when it comes to your giving, are you giving Jesus your best? Jesus is challenging you and I here to do better. He's saying, I want to be first in your life. Am I first in your life? To be a follower of mine, you need to be first. And that might require you and me, it will require you and me to sacrifice. But here's the good news. Write this down, point number three. The cost of following Jesus calls for a long-term commitment. That's a, good, that's a good thing. The cost of following Jesus requires a long-term commitment. You say, Mike, how is that good news? Well, it's good news because it, it reinforces this truth that Jesus does not expect per perfection. He simply asks for growth. It's a long-term perspective. When we give our heart to Jesus and we ask him to be the Lord of our life, he doesn't just instantly become the Lord of our life, the king on our throne. Now it takes time for that to happen. To lay down our cross, so to speak. You know, Jesus challenges us, and we talk a lot about this probably every week. He doesn't want us to live and spend our energy in the past and yesterday. No, he wants us to keep moving forward, right? It's a long-term commitment. It's a long-term invitation to growth. Following Jesus calls for a long-term commitment. That's the cost. Let's finish this story. Go back to verse 28. Luke 14, verse 28. So Jesus gives a couple of examples. He says, don't begin kind of this journey. Don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there is enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money and then everyone would laugh at you. They would say, there's the person who started the building and that they couldn't afford to finish it. You ever seen a building that was started that never got finished? Where he says, what king would go to war against another king without first sitting down with his counselors to discuss whether his army of 10,000 could defeat the 20,000 soldiers marching against him? And if he can't... <clears throat> If he can't defend or defeat, he will send a delegation to discuss terms of peace while the enemy is still far away. You know, here in this Bible story, Jesus gives us two examples of someone who does some forward looking, right, in order to finish the task. He gives the example of a construction worker. He gives the example of a king going into battle. And I think the gist of what Jesus is teaching you and I here and encouraging us to practice that in our Christian faith and on our Christian journey, it, was, it is important for us and it is wise for us to letter A in your notes to solicit collaboration. Solicit collaboration and let her be to confidently add our own flavor. So as we go through life, we're supposed to solicit collaboration and say, how would you play this guitar? How would you play this keyboard? How would you build this whatever? But then also recognizing that we're unique and we're going to add our own flavor to the project. A wise builder Jesus consults. We'll consult others before starting a construction project. A wise king will consult his advisors before going to war. Do I have a chance of winning? Or should I look for another option? Friends, Jesus is reminding us as his followers that following him is a, a long-term commitment. And so, again, let me just affirm you for being here today. Let me affirm you for, for being here today, whether it's in person or for those of you who are tuning in online. I want to affirm you because it illustrates to me that and to God that you want to grow. 
If you didn't want to grow, you wouldn't be here. You probably got 15 other things that you could do right now. But you're choosing with intentionality to participate in this conversation. Good job. You're soliciting collaboration. You're recognizing that you have blind spots. We all have blind spots. Would you agree with that? What don't I know? What am I not seeing? What are seeing, you seeing that I don't see? That's part of collaboration. You know, Friday night, we, we, uh, we had our football game, the Battle of the Bell, the Costa Mesa Mustangs against the Estancia Eagles, and the Eagles whomped us, uh, whomped us because I'm a Mustang fan, 42 to 10. And, and Kirk, I had Kirk, you know, my, my spotter call me at the last minute and said, hey, I can't, I can't be there. He's the guy who helps call out the numbers, and I call up Kirk, and I said, hey, can you join me? He said, you know, yeah, sure, because Kirk's got, like, eagle eyes and stuff. But part of having another person in the booth is because he gets to see things that I don't see. He catches things that I might miss. And together, we're a team to kind of bring everybody into, into the game. Are you with me? Collaboration is so important for us. It requires a team. The wise builder will solicit input. The mature Christian will ask others to join them on their spiritual journey. And so as one who has been invited to join you on your spiritual journey, I'd like it to lead us in a closing prayer. And here's why we want to lead in this closing prayer. Look at the last verse Jesus says here in verse 33, 34. He says salt is to provide flavor, right? Salt is good for seasoning, Jesus says, but flavorless salt is worthless and it's only good to be thrown away. And so I want my life to have flavor. I want my witness to have zest. Do you? That's why you're here, right? That's why I'm here, right? And so let's ask God to make our lives salty because following Jesus has a cost. Following Jesus requires a personal investment. You're making that personal investment. I think God is honored by the fact that you're here and you're tuning in today. So now let's ask God to continue to grow us to be salty characters. Okay, so put, your, put, your, put everything down. Put your palms open. Take a deep breath in. Just hold it. Just kind of exhale. Just get all that energy out of you. And first and foremost, if you've never given your heart to Jesus, I want to encourage you to do so. I can't make that decision for you. But if you've never given your heart to Jesus, simply pray this in your heart. Just say, Jesus, please forgive my sins. I invite you to work in my life. I invite you to transform me into the person that you want me to be. Good. Just say, Jesus, like Joseph on the guitar and like Chance on the piano, I want to grow. I want to keep growing. So right now, in this moment, I invite Jesus to be my Savior, to forgive my sins, and my Lord, to, to be the Lord of my life, the captain of my ship. Good. Now for the rest of us, pray this. Say, Jesus, you teach me in this Bible story that to follow you has a high cost. So please forgive me when I put other things and make other people a high prior a higher priority with my time than what I give to you. Say Jesus, I want you to be first in my life, but I need your help because on my own it's not going to happen. I confess that that other things are going to come in and clamor for my energy. And Jesus, I need your help to, to, to put you first. And so right now in this closing moments of this conversation, Jesus, I pray that you would poke me. Poke me in those areas of my life where you are not first. And please give me the, the habits Please give me the, the faith and the courage to develop the habits that I need for following and obeying you and to make you my highest priority. 
this is my prayer today. In Jesus' name, amen.